Thanks for tuning in to leftcoastnews.net, news and information from the wacky, sometimes communist, liberal west coast of the United States. For more, visit leftcoastnews.net. Well, on the left coast, the war against farmers and against the use of natural gas and irrigation and your own water is harsh at work right now. Something you may not have heard was this deal that was done in secret, basically. The nation's energy secretary defended a recent federal agreement on the lower Snake River dams after Representative Dan Newhouse, Republican from Washington, said breaching the dams would be catastrophic, as it would. He questioned Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm earlier this week at a hearing of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Energy and Water. The agreement made public in December lays the groundwork for the federal government to work with four Northwest tribes and the states of Oregon and Washington to protect and restore salmon, steelhead, and other native fish to the Columbia River Basin, including the Snake River. It also requires studies on how the benefits of the four Snake River dams in Washington could be replaced. Benefits include electricity production, barging of farm products and other goods, irrigation and recreation. Commitments made to states and tribes in the agreement are estimated to cost the federal government more than $1 billion. The agreement worked out behind closed doors in federal litigation has been called a roadmap toward breaching the dams from Ice Harbor near Pasco to Lower Granite near Lewiston, Idaho. The agreement makes commitments to develop energy replacement for the dams as well as recommending spillage operations, Newhouse said. What energy replacements are going to replace those dams? Spilling more water over the dams rather than using it to produce electricity can help juvenile salmon, but too much spill increases gases such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen in the water that can kill juvenile salmon. Adjusting spilling operations could make the dams functionally obsolete and useless, Newhouse said. Energy prices will skyrocket. People who depend on the river system will suffer, and I believe the salmon population will be harmed as well. It is, in fact, a de facto breaching of the dams. Congress has the sole authority to breach the dams, Granholm said during the Wednesday hearing. I think the agreement was a positive step to replenish salmon, to be able to address hatcheries, to work with the tribes on additional power, she said. But that's because there's not enough power being produced rather than to replace hydropower, she said. The agreement calls for the federal government to assist the four lower Columbia River tribes, the Yakima, Umatilla, Nez Pierce, and Warm Springs, in developing tribally sponsored clean energy projects. Newhouse said it seems clear from the Biden administration that the plan is in fact breaching the dams. But Granholm said the agreement would prevent consideration of breaching the dams for 10 years, although it includes a study of replacement benefits. There is no de facto or subterfuge here, she said. Newhouse also asked a Washington state official about the impacts of dam breaching. He and six other Republican Northwest congressional representatives, including Washington's Kathy McMorris Rogers, recently sent a letter to Roger Miller, Washington State Secretary of Transportation, asking how the state would handle increased truck and train traffic if the Snake River dams are breached. At a January hearing of the House Subcommittee on Transportation and Infrastructure, Representative Lori Chavez de Remer, Oregon Republican, told Miller that about 39,200 rail cars and nearly 150,800 semi trucks a year would be needed to move cargo that currently is barged on the Snake River and Columbia Rivers. That would require three times the number of heavy and tractor trailer drivers now employed in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho at a time of worker shortages in both trucking and rail, the letter said. <clears throat> now, 60% of all wheat exports are barged through the lower Snake River dams with a single four barge tow carrying as much wheat as about 540 semi trucks. It is the lowest cost shipping option, according to the lawmakers signing the letter. Without the dams to allow barging on the Snake River, the increased fuel costs, highway maintenance costs, terminal facility maintenance costs, 
driver pay and vehicle maintenance costs would come to $69 million a year, the letter said. Rail costs would likely be higher as well, it said. <clears throat> More than $1 billion would be needed for capital investments in highway, rail, grain elevators, and other infrastructure, it said. Capacity on highways and railroads would be at an all-time high. The letter asked Miller for more information on how the Washington State Department of Transportation could continue to meet transportation needs if the Lower Snake River dams are breached, and how it would provide alternatives to continue to grow the Pacific Northwest economy. I mean, this is just the continuation of the insanity that goes on in the Northwest. The amount of usage that river gets that would be harmed by this bill is ridiculous. For what? Figure out some other way to get those salmon through there. Why is this being done in secret with the tribes? Why do the tribes get to have the energy benefits of creating alternative energy. There's no alternative energy to that. You're not going to build a solar or wind farm that's going to equal the amount of energy those dams put out. Farms in eastern Washington and Oregon rely on water from those rivers to irrigate their farms. Does anybody care about the food production anymore? We need the added capacity of the electricity from those dams, especially with the state going after natural gas and any other form of energy besides electricity. And this is clean electricity energy. Hydrogen doesn't create any greenhouse gas. And yet, they're going to tear that down to come up with what? Inslee also just signed, he passed the Engrossed Substitute Hass Bill 1589 last night. They passed it at 2 a.m. What does that tell you about that? Inslee's going to sign this bill that basically bans natural gas. It's going to allow utilities, Puget Sound Energy specifically, to start planning how to move away from natural gas. Much of King County, Pierce County, Thurston County, and Skagit County, people have gas services. Gas water heaters, gas fireplace, gas cook cut top. You would have to replace all those with electric, and that's going to cost somewhere between forty dollars and $70,000 per home. When you're looking at 900,000 gas customers in the Puget Sound Energy Service Area, that's a lot of people. And this is supposed to happen by 2030, in six years. Why do they want to phase out natural gas? Natural gas was touted as the clean energy for years. Now, they want everybody on electrical. Why is that? Well, I think it's because they're going to make more money off you if you're on electric. More ways to control it. More ways to charge you for it. This is all just part of their plan. And meanwhile, while they want you on electrical, they want your car to be electric, they're tearing down the dams that create the electricity. We're going to get ourselves into the same situation that California is in, that they don't create enough energy for the people in the state. And they've got to import it or buy it from out of state. Everybody is going to be in the same boat. Right now, Washington can create plenty of its own energy for itself. How much longer is that going to last when you have politicians like Inslee, and Bob Ferguson tearing down our infrastructure for fish. Now this could be moot as far as the gas ban goes if voters pass Initiative 2117 in November to repeal the Climate Commitment Act and do away with the state's carbon market. Hopefully that happens, but 
based on past experiences with voters on this uh, in this state on this left coast, I would have to say that's probably not going to happen. People love to punish themselves here. People love higher prices and taxes. They're not going to be satisfied until you're paying exorbitant costs for your electricity and your power and your vehicles. And we have rolling brownouts and blackouts or maybe no electricity at all. Inslee and Ferguson and all his little fanatics live in some fantasy world where all their solar power and wind power dreams can come true, but that's just not reality. Those two things don't create enough power to match what you can get from gas or hydro dam, hydrogen power that comes from these dams. Maybe they just want to go back to living on the plains in teepees and cabins. Sometimes it seems like that's what they want. Horses and buggies. I mean, I'd be all right with that, but I don't think these people who live in these cities like Seattle understand where their food comes from or where their power comes from or how that's created and what it takes to do that. They seem to be at a loss for this uh, reality that they live in. On top of this dam situation and energy situation in Washington, you've got the state of Oregon going after small farmers, telling them they can't use water from their own wells to water their farms if they have chickens, cows, goats, sheep, whatever. If they have barn structures with floors, concrete or gravel floors, they're not allowed to use their own water for that without going through some sort of permitting process, which may or may not be approved. And they say that the water from these people's wells belongs to the public. Water in a well on your own property is a public resource that you cannot have access to for taking care of your animals. Now, of course, there was an exemption for commercial operations. So they're protecting these large commercial corporations, but not allowing the small farmers to make a living for themselves. Now, apparently there was a lot of pushback when this came out. There was a few stories in the news where, you know, this, these small farmers were not, didn't know what they were going to do. This is how they made a living, and now they weren't going to be allowed to do this on their own property. And so Oregon has reversed course because of all the pushback from the public. So good job, public. But you have places all over this country that are telling you you can't have chickens. There's a town back east that's banning chickens. People who have small, small little, you know, I'm not even going to say a farm, but, you know, 10, 20 chickens on their property. And they're being banned because supposedly they create a rodent problem. Chickens eat rodents. You have towns and cities telling you you can't have a garden on your property. Homeowners associations telling you you can't have this stuff on your property your property you cannot be self-sufficient they don't want you to be self-sufficient there is just this constant attack from the left that if you don't fall in line if you don't get your services from them or the government you are some kind of enemy you cannot have things on your own property to take care of yourself and your family they want to act like you're some kind of radical if you're doing that. The government wants to charge you for permits and licensing to have these things on your property. It's ridiculous. It's your property. 
you should be able to do what you want as long as you're not hurting anybody else. If you have property and you haven't done these things yet and you're thinking about getting chickens, or rabbits, goats, sheep, whatever, whatever, get something, do something so you are a little more closer to being self-sufficient. You should do it now before these places start making a bunch of regulations and you can't. This is the time you should be preparing. Thanks for listening to Left Coast News. For more, visit leftcoastnews.net. Please subscribe, like, and share to your social media. We appreciate your support.